tips to unsteady your feet come on and your hands give God praise here it is come on here we go breaking open every tide of mine your love is breathing out into my life you take my burdens and you make it light you make it light Break the night. I choose to follow you for all my life. I know that you are always by my side. You're by my side. And everything we do, we choose to praise you. No matter what they say, we will go your way. Dancing to your feet, we can't contain it. We're heaven loose as we celebrate. By my side In everything we do We choose to praise you No matter what they say We will go your way Dancing to your feet We can't contain it We're letting the loose As we celebrate This is how we party This is how we We lift our eyes, 
we tune our hearts into your beat where you walk there you'll be the fire in our eyes our lives alive your love untamed is blazing out the streets will glow forever bright your glory's breaking through the
Hosea gets this picture from God to go after his wife and to buy her back. He pays the price to have his wife come back to him. And it's this picture of Jesus and his bride, Jesus and his church. We all have gone astray. We've all left our husband or someone else started to worship other idols, other gods. But Jesus is committed to his bride, committed to his church so much that he would pay the price to have his bride back. And we're so grateful for that price. The price that Jesus paid was his own life to have his bride back with him. And this morning, I want you to remember and recognize that you've been bought with a price, that you are loved. That husband didn't scold his wife, didn't blame her or, you know, um, punish her. His love for her led him to buy her back. You are loved by God. You are loved by God so much that he would give his one and only son to die on a cross for you. That's why we sing this morning about the goodness of God. In our life, he has been faithful. Come on, let's just sing out our praise and thanksgiving to him this morning.
if you know the background of that goodness of God song but Gene Johnson wrote that because God provided another child for them through adoption and I just today I believe God wants that was that was you we love that song about the goodness of God surely the goodness of God will follow me all the days of my life if you look at the end of Psalm 23, it says, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I just, right now, I want you to realise 
God wants to provide. Not your greed, but your need. So I want you to just lift a hand to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I ask right now, Holy Spirit, that you would provide every need. Lord, the ones that are in this place, I don't know where they're, at, where they're at. I don't know what they're facing. I don't know what difficulty. I don't know what provision. But God, I thank You. You are our great provider. You're Jehovah Jireh. You're the King of Kings and You're the Lord of Lords. You provide healing. You provide wholeness. You provide purpose. You provide destiny. You provide life. In the midst of difficult and dark situations, the light of Christ can come in and touch lives. God, I pray right now that You would touch lives. You would pour Your Spirit out upon Your people. Holy Spirit, that You become alive in us, that we'd set a light, a flame within each one, that Lord, Your hand would be upon each one. God, I pray for the glory of the Lord to be revealed through His people. I pray for Your hand, Lord, would be revealed to people in Jesus' Name. Everyone that's put their hand up, God, I pray, Lord, that You would touch them even now in this service and in this place. But it's not for us. It's so that we can give all our glory and the honour and the praise to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Jesus, Jesus. I speak Jesus over your situations. I speak the love of God over your situation. I speak His Name into every area of your life. I speak Jesus. We open our hearts to receive all that He's given, all that He's attained by the cross of Calvary. Release that in Jesus' Name. Release that in Jesus' Name. Release that in Jesus' Name. Pour Your Spirit out, God. Pour Your Spirit out. 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 Shut up, Thank You, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Holy Ghost. Oh, Jesus. Oh. If only we knew how much He really, really loved us. How much He wants to be a part of our lives. I pray that today is an extremely special day for you in His presence. I pray that you tangibly know who He is, not just a word, but tangibly know who the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is because He wants fellowship with each one. I wanna pray for somebody and then, you know, we've got a number of people that are going through difficult situations. We've got people that have been diagnosed with cancer. There's others that are heart issues and all those. And I wanna lift each one of those. We've got another man which got a cardiac procedure shortly. Why don't you, you know, agree with me in prayer. The Bible says where two or three agree, it shall be done according to the will of Him. So Father, I pray right now for all these ones that are facing difficult situations. God, you know, it seems like it's insurmountable. It seems like it's a big mountain, but you say we can say to the mountain, be ye removed. And we say to the mountain of cancer and the mountain of illness and sickness and those things that people are facing, heart disease, all those things. God, we pray to that mountain, to come into submission of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords through Jesus Christ. God, I pray for healing and wholeness for each one. God, it says by Your stripes, they are healed. God, we speak Your love and Your touch upon each one. I pray for a turnaround in situations even today, right now. I pray that there would be a turnaround in their situations. God, that they would sense Your presence and then sense a change. And we give You all the glory and we give You all the honour and we give You all the praise. And we thank you for that in Jesus' Name. Why don't you give the Lord a hand in this place? Hallelujah. You know, a moment, one moment with God changes things. You know, I I, I remember ringing a person who had a, a very bad case of shingles. And I rang him off cuff and just, you know, I felt to ring him. And when I rang him, I prayed for him on the phone. And he, he, he rang me at the end of that week and said, that day that you rang changed. My, that was a change, a turning point in my situation. So today is a God who wants to provide and bring change. I believe there's a word for each one of you today, that today is the day. Let's believe that God's gonna touch lives today, amen? Let's believe God is going to turn miracles. He's a miracle working God. 
I will stand, I will stand, I will stand for healing and wholeness, even though I don't see it fully yet, but I will stand for it because that's what my Bible says. We will heal the sick, He will raise the dead. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So, kia ora, talofa, um, hello, ni hao, welcome to church. What a great place to be. We've got an amazing day today. We've got an amazing service. We're gonna have some wonderful people being baptised shortly over here and we're really excited about that. It's gonna be an amazing thing for them. So um, I'm Steve, I'm one of the leadership team here and um, I want to, you know, what, what God is so good, amen? God is so good. You're in, you came to the right place today to worship and to be a part of what God is doing today. So we're going to um, have some, have, I'd like to release the, the rock stars and the, and the superstars. They've got the two rooms out there, the Ignition, uh, Flame um, and, and all those teams. We thank you Kids Ministry for all that you do. What a great, why don't you get up and say hello to somebody and just, you know, grab a hold of their hand. Welcome to church and we'll get the baptism people ready. Thank you, team. Good job. Good job, Chris. If you haven't been to a baptism before, you're in for a treat. I think uh, I, I love, I remember being baptized in this pool in, um, it was 21 years ago, 22 years ago. So shows you how good it can be because I'm still here. Hallelujah. Um, what I want to do is we, we, we're going to have a, 
a baptism, what we want you to do is if you're friends and family of the people being baptized, you're most welcome to come down, gather around and, and be a part of it. And uh, we're going to have, um, you know, maybe two or three. If you've got a, something that God places on your heart as a prophetic word for them, we are definitely open to you doing that. So um, if we get to two or three and you've still got something, then we'll just write it down and send it to them because it's really important. You can bring it into the, into the office or send it into us and then we'll put it with the other words that they've actually had um, along the way. So it's, it's really good. So it's exciting. Who's been baptized? Okay, all those without your hands, you're next. <laughs> All right, so we've got the first one is Bianca. So Bianca is going to be the first one to come in. So come in, Bianca. All right, anyone want to come down? Come down. Come be a part of it. She might need it to read the note. Does she need it to read the note? Or no? She can read. <laughs> Bianca. Ah, oh, it's so good, isn't it? So good. So pleased you've made the decision to, you know, to take the step with God. So what, is, what, is, what does baptism mean to you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so in my baptism class with Tony, he asked me the same question. And I told him, as a child, I grew up always a Christian, so I can't really pinpoint any time in my life where I've been saved like many other people have confessed. So my wonderful parents raised me as a Christian, and yes, and my siblings, we were all, like I thought, while we were praying, fighting with them was so nice, <laughs> because that made forgiveness easy, you know, so... Um, yeah, let me just check my notes. <laughs> this is not easy for me to speak in front of many people. As a child, I always wait until the end of the class to please ask my teacher, can I just give my speech now to you? Um, so now I don't want to do that. I want to confess in front of all of you today that I want to give my heart to Jesus and I want to be born again. <laughs> Bianca, I confess of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why don't you just reach your hand forward as we pray? You are loyal to me. You are faithful and you always will be. I have never walked alone. I've never been abandoned. You are my inheritance. You are my strength and shield. And I have confidence. You go We all know Proverbs 31 women, but this morning God said to me, you need to do this in Afrikaans, so please forgive me. Spreek 31, a knap vrou is baie werd, baie meer as edelstene. Haar man steen op haar, en pluk vruchte van haar werk. Sy bring vir hom net voordeel nie, nadeel nie. Haar hele leven lang, skies het ek net geraad terug gaan. Sy maak wol en vlas by mekaar en geniet het om dit te verwerk. Sy is soos die handelskeep en sy bring die kos van ver af in. Sy staan op as dit nog nacht is en maak vir haar huisgesin kos. Sy oorweeg die waarde van een stuk grond en koop dit. Sy sit het onderwingerd met geld wat sy self verdien het. 
We see you every day work with children, and I tell you, it's just an honor to see you work with those kids. You influence so many of those kids out there, and it's all for God's kingdom. That's all for God's kingdom, and just keep on going on. We are so proud of you, and this is only the beginning. This is the begin. This is the begin. So I was praying um, last night about all the people being baptized, and I actually saw you as a tree planted, and you were gaining sustenance and drawing sustenance from the Lord. You know, and it was like that no matter what's going on around you, there's going to be fruit that comes out of your life. No matter what happens, because a tree puts its roots down and gains its sustenance, even if the ground looks dry, it still has sustenance because your roots go down deep. And it comes from um, Psalm 1. 1 to 3, it says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in, in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. I really felt that for you. Prospers. Prospers. Jesus. God would say that your walk with him has not always been easy. You've gone through trials, you've gone through hardships, you've gone through things in your life that you've sometimes cried out and said to God, why? Why am I going through this? Why are we going through this? And the Lord is say, but I have always been with you in those moments because I have been preparing you for that which is to come and for that which what I will do through you and with you. That I have built in you a faith. I have built in you a tenacity. I have built in you a strength that you would know my power and you would reshine that light and you will reveal that to people because even though you might say that God is my inheritance I say to you that you are my inheritance and I bought you with a price and I am filling you with gold I am filling you with silver I am filling you with precious stones because you I see of great value so great a value that I place those things in you that you might reveal them and shine them to those that you will come across even in the days to come not just your family, not just those that are around about you, but in the days to come you will come across people you will come across lives and the gold, the silver and the precious stones in you will change their lives and their hearts Amen Awesome Hey Bianca So I was just praying for you this morning, the word that came to mind was charisma and I just felt there was two parts to it the word charisma means compelling attractiveness or charm that can inspire devotion in others. And as that saying, you know, she has tremendous charisma and stage presence. And I believe this is what you carry, people are attracted to your charisma. The way you go about doing what you do with your heart and soul. And for example, in the short time I've known you, and I can tell you have such love, devotion, commitment to the kids that you teach. This inspires and encourages these young ones. But it's more than that. Your life will inspire others to go after God. And the other thing about charisma, I'm not sure if you know much about horses or equestrian or anything. Oh, you do? Oh, there you go. Praise the Lord. Um, charisma, of course, is a well-known equestrian horse um, that... Mark Todd used to ride for New Zealand and it's one of the greatest equestrians actually in the world um, and the thing with the horse riding you know it's a team effort and the rider is on the back of the horse and I just felt God wants to remind you that he's got your back Shit. you know just like, during, just like during the show jumping part of the competition when the horse clips the rail makes a mistake, they keep going. The rider's still there. God's still got your back. And when you give God the reins of your life, He will lead and guide you. No matter how many rails you knock off on the way, you can still cross the finish line with the confidence you have in Him and in His victory. Amen. Why don't you give Him a hand? Bless you, Bianca.
If you have any other words, then please write them down and send them in. It'd be great. So bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. It's so good, huh? It's so good. Awesome. Well, we need, need next one through. So we've got, um, we've got Jade, Jade Gillespie. Jada, Jada, where's Jada? Over here. Come on, Jada. Woohoo! Give her a hand. You okay? And in the pool, we've got Julia and David who are going to. Um, We tried to heat the water up for you, Jada, so it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. Jada, you know, I mean, this is an amazing step, and good on you. You know, you're leading the way today for many other younger in the generation to say, hey, today is a day I'm making a stand, and I think good on you for doing that and taking that. So, And what does baptism mean to you? You might need to do Um, I think to me it, um, sorry, I've just lost my place already. <laughs> um, well, I think I've always been the kind of person that like very much wants to have a plan and be in control of what's happening. But I think baptism is just about letting go and letting God have control over what's happening and following what he has a plan for my life. Man, that's awesome. <laughs> I'll take that. Yeah, give her a hand. Come on, that's great. Jada, on the confession of your faith in Jesus, we baptise you now into him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jada, the scripture I've got for you is from Psalms 52, verse 8 and 9. But I am like an olive tree, flourishing in the house of God. I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. For what you have done, I will always praise you in the presence of your faithful people. And I will hope in your name, for your name is good. And you know, later as you go and read this, that's, you know, that's a statement, that's a declaration that you can be declaring like every day, you are like an olive tree flourishing in his house. And you know, the olive tree flowers and then it produces fruit. And we know that the olives, like they go through a time of crushing and press, pressing, but it produces the most amazing, fragrant, rich, tasty oil. And that oil, is going to break the yoke. 
but also that oil you'll use to minister to others. You'll minister to others and their brokenness and what they go through. That anointing oil will break the yoke for them as well. Yeah, Jada, when I was just really kind of praying for a word from from God this week and last week for you, I know that um, this is really a turning point for you. Just a new beginning for you. And um, yeah, God just really just gave me the scripture for you. Um, 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and impurity. And I really believe that not just for believers, but just for anyone you come in contact with, you're amazing. And I know that that, that is that is what you do. Hey Jada. So when I was just praying for you, I got a picture of um, God handing you like this small box. There was nothing special about the outside. It was very plain. But when it opened, I just knew it was one of those jewellery boxes with a little ballerina in it. Do you know, do you know the one? <laughs> Been around for a long time. And you think of ballerinas. They're very skilled. They're highly trained. They move with such grace and elegance, smoothness, smoothness and almost perfection. And though I'm not a fan myself, um, there's such a beautiful form of dancing. And God sees you like that. One full of grace, elegance, beauty and perfect. And in Bali, there is one, you know, one move that most people know of and that's being called being on point. And Jada, know this, God is always on point. He's perfect and he never makes mistakes. You're created by him, loved by him and you are unique. There's no other Jada on the planet. That's how special you are to him. And in that box is many different types of beautiful jewels. First, you're one of those precious jewels. And second, God the Father wants to gift you with these precious jewels to adorn you. And today it's like he's adding to this beautiful person you already are. So that which he has done on the inside of your life reflects outwardly his beauty and glory and enhances who he is through you. Yeah, good job. This might seem a little bit symbolic, but I see you as a hummingbird and you have been around the anointing of God like this hummingbird. You've been flying and flittering and feeding of God and the things of God. And you've gone down into the waters of baptism and God's saying this is the beginning of a metamorphosis in your life. That today is the beginning of a change. That even though that in the days to come you will still be like that hummingbird that feeds on the things of God and comes to the things of God. That God is raising you up like an eagle. And you're going to soar on the wings of the Spirit of the Lord. And He is going to give you great insight and great ability to see that which is in people's lives and hearts and to see that which is in circumstances. He's going to put a prophetic anointing upon your life that as you see, you're going to speak out words. You're going to begin to declare and decree. You're going to bring such a powerful change into the lives and the hearts of people that you are actually going to bring a change into the move of God that God wants to do because He is anointing you and empowering you and giving you that insight that you will see like an eagle sees that even though you will be 
be from, as it were, a great height in the things of God, you will look down and you will be able to see where people are struggling. You will be able to see those things that are going on and you will speak to those things and God will move on your behalf and they will be changed on the behalf of the people that you cry out for. So therefore, stay close to the things of God. Stay as that hummingbird, but soar as an eagle and stay close and feed at the things because as you feed, God will give you the insight and the power and the strength to do those things that He's calling you into. Amen. Praise God. Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen. Wow. All right, next one up, we've got Liam jumping in the pool. Awesome Liam, he's got Melissa and Bruce. Go Liam. I remember when you first came into church. All I can say is, wow. Thank you. You know, God's amazing, isn't he, Liam? Wow. To see you walk in and to see what God's done in your life in such a very short period of time and see your heart to, to race after him and such an awesome, awesome thing. So what does baptism mean to you, my friend? I'm getting baptized today because... I just want to confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I used to live a very sinful lifestyle, but out of God's love and grace, he sent his son to die for me. And he rose from the dead to present everlasting life. I declare today that I'm no longer bound to that sin, but I've been born again as a new creation in the spirit. <laughs> After all that God's done in my life and the lives of the people around me, I just want to give all the glory back to God who deserves eternal praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Immediately I think there's a preacher standing in the pool. I, you know, that's exactly what I, I think. <laughs> you, man, awesome, that conviction. Did any one of you want to do the baptism or do you want me to say it? I can say it? All right. Hands across in the back. We're gonna. If we don't get you down, we're gonna push you down again. We're gonna get you completely down. But um, Liam, in confession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize you into Him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right down. Right down. Right down. Right down. Push him right down. That's it. Woo! Thank you, Lord. This song? You are holy. Oh, Liam. Liam, Liam. That's. Are you Lord God Almighty? Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Amen. Sometimes ago, I. I went to a Chinese um, Bible devotion and I walk in and there this young Kiwi boy there and I was thinking, wow, there's a Kiwi that know how to speak 
English. Ah, sorry, uh, Mandarin, Chinese. So I went over there and asked, what is your name? He said, Liam. Do you know how to speak Chinese? He said, no. Okay. You know, there is a few people in your life that God used to bring you to this stage. Will, who opened his mouth and invited you. Bruce, that spent his time every Sunday discipling you. But it is you who say yes. And there are three things that you exhibit. Um, I, I see it so prominent in, in, in the short time that I know you. First one is you are teachable. The second one is you have reverence. And third one, you have hope. I, I just thank God. Thank God for your faith and your love towards God. Hallelujah. Uh, Liam, I remember the first time I met you through Will. So we got you in to try some Chinese food. And I'm glad that over the time through the discipleship, you move on from Chinese food to the bread of life. And I simply pray that you continue to take the bread of life every day and shave the, your family and friends for the rest of your life. Glory be unto God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Liam, that which you have confessed, you shall proclaim, not only in the small places, but as you come to know me, says the Lord, I will take you to the big places where there are many needs. And men, women, and young people, children, will come and confess my son Jesus Christ as Lord as you proclaim it. Hold that in your heart. Liam, um, I believe there's a new grace coming your way. Uh, God wants to do more than you could ask or think. Ephesians 3, 20 to 21 says, Now to him who is able to immeasurably more than we could ask or think according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God wants to expand your horizons and your abilities. Be prepared to expand. I thought about a balloon, you know, a balloon being flat doesn't actually become what it's designed to be until it's actually stretched, until it's blown. And I believe that's happening today. And in the days ahead, you're going to become more of what God has created you and called you to be. And final one with Chris. Liam, the Lord's been building a strength into your life and um, He's going to continue to do that. Uh, you've noticed um, perhaps struggles at times and you've thought, well, I'm not even strong in those areas. But the Lord's going to build strength. And as you learn how to uh, apply that in your life and as you learn how to build strength, you'll stand in times of difficulty so that others will see you, that you have strength of the Lord in you. And it will really stand out at those difficult times and you'll be able to speak to people um, because you stand in that place of strength that He's built into your life. Amen. Amen. Why don't we give the Lord a hand? Amen. Now, the last one we've got is his mum, Michelle, which I'm so excited about. So Michelle's into the, going to the pool and she's going to have Sophie and Chris Playle to come in. So usually we wait till the end for the words and things that, that people say. Michelle, sorry. Michelle. Yeah, I'm getting there. Um, 
you, your song is, is Angus Day, but the thing that's, I think today is a very significant day. You have made a decision to follow the Lord. You are being obedient in baptism. And for some reason, I think the past, this, this has not been easy for you. But today marks a change. Your heart is toward the Lord, and He wants to let you know that you will be able to hear His voice. And with that, a willingness that you'll have to obey and to hear and, and to work that through. This you'll see you have a close relationship. After today, I think you're going to have a closer relationship with the Lord because of your obedience and with what you're doing. So I just and so for you, what does baptism mean? Okay. As a new believer, I believe baptism is an important step in my journey of my faith in God. I am excited to be baptised today and want to share with you all that I love Jesus and accept Him as my Lord and Saviour. I also want to use this time to thank Jesus for His forgiveness of all my sins and also for all the incredible things He has done for me and in the lives of others around me. All glory, honour, power and praise belongs to you. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. On confession of your faith in the Lord Jesus, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb, you are holy, holy, are you Lord God Almighty, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, for oh, you are holy. Genesis 28, 12 onwards. This is Jacob. He had a dream in which this, he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to the heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord and the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. All the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and I will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. When Jacob awoke from this, his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. Surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. What the Lord wants you to know today is all these days, 
Jacob was under the blessing and authority of his father and mother. And this guy is going away. He did not have anything to worry. He was fed. But now he is alone in the desert. No no don't know what to do. That's when God says, "It's not today. I'm taking control of your life." Since your birth or even before you were formed in your mother's womb i've chosen you i've called you by my name and i've been with you but today i'm revealing myself to you as your lord god and from now on i will be your lord and you will see god's faithfulness in every step you take and you will be faithful to him and to his kingdom in Jesus name amen amen I don't know your name but God has just given me Isaiah 43:4 for you I will give up whole nations to save your life because you are precious to me and because I love you and give you honor He has I don't know if you've seen there's so many nations here today South Africans Asians Kiwis everybody but God has just confessed that Isaiah 43 says I will give up nations for you because you are so precious to yeah. me. That's really good. Amen. Amen. Um so I believe that this is a prophetic picture for you and your family today that um as a son and mother have gone through the waters of baptism it's um there's a generational thing on you and and it's like this act prophetic act is going to change the course of the Hooper family that I don't know what your um maiden family name is but it's like you are changing the course of the generations to come your grandchildren your great grandchildren your great great and it's like that everything that's been prophesied is being spoken in to the generations and it's like um it seems like such a small thing but it's such a big thing in one moment of time in this one prophetic act and it's just hold on to that and everything that goes on from now on you speak God's word into those situations no matter what they look like because a year ago you would probably never have thought you would have never have thought Kelly that you would be standing here you know but a word was spoken and you know it's like with you Liam it's like um when I first saw you I see a quiet humble tall guy and yet the minute you had the microphone in your hand it's like oh my gosh he's actually an oracle of god it's like there's something in you that is so fierce and you are an oracle for the lord and in you i see michelle just it's almost like you have that thing of one of my favorite scriptures to just all i require of you is to walk softly before the lord and there's something in you that even in this it's been like you've been quite nervous and it's quite like quite bewildered almost maybe by it and yet you've just been so willing to do it because your desire is to walk softly before the lord and you put that you put softness and fierceness together in the prophetic picture today and you wait and see how awesome what awesomeness is going to come out of this so so father i just um pray lord for the hooper family i pray for each of them lord god that you would show them their purpose and their destiny father that you would reveal to them your kingdom lord every one of them even those that don't know you at this point god begin to give them revelation after revelation father that they would change the generations to come through this father that you would give them wisdom you would give them the spirit of counsel and might father god that that would be on them that there would be something about them that where the spirit of the lord will come on them not just be in them but come on them to change generations in jesus name amen 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 all right well look thank you all what a what amen amen eh this is so good so i'm i'm so blessed to've been involved yeah no definitely so god bless you all and um thank you we'll pray for you as it as it continues so well give them a hand give them a hand
And I've got the uh, absolute awesome privilege uh, to intro um, Jeremy Witherow, who is going to come and actually share the word with us today. And I love the heart of this man. He, he's actually got a little bit of comedy. Uh, hopefully that'll come through today, Jeremy. Um, but he's a prophetic. He's got a prophetic edge to his ministry. And he goes overseas. He spends most of his time in Singapore ministering over there on the prophetic. So we ask that you'd open your hearts to receive the word of God through him. Amen. Hello. Bula. And young Haseo. Salama Pagi. Nihao Ma. That's probably all I know. <laughs> Mabuhai. Uh, hey, it's really wonderful to uh, be with you all today and such an uh, interesting time and in, uh, service that we've been having so far. And uh, it's just a joy to be able to come and to bring the Word of God uh, to each and every one of you uh, here this morning. And we're just going to put our slides up there, thanks. And we're going to get underway straight away. All right, so I'm going to uh, bring a, a message today called Uni uh, uh, United by the Cross. United by the Cross. And... There's uh, just wanting to bring a spotlight on the Corinthian church because this is going to form the contact, uh, context and the uh, background uh, to the message this morning. Well, we know that around 50 AD, the Apostle Paul, he visits the ancient city of Corinth in Greece where he spends some 18 months preaching the gospel and starting a church there. And after that time, and in keeping with his apostolic ministry, his traveling ministry, Paul leaves Corinth for Ephesus to continue his ministry there. And it's while he's based in Ephesus that he receives a report from some of the elders in Corinth about the state of the church that he had started there. And we go on to read in 1 Corinthians 1 uh, and Verse 11, he says, My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. Now, that's kind of a grim start to his sharing in this letter. And so it's highly probable that Paul learned of the contentions at Corinth through a letter that had been sent, a letter which paints this very grim picture of these problems and issues that had developed in the congregation during his time of absence. And the issues it contained required his immediate attention and a response. Although we don't have that letter with us, we do have is the letter to the church at Corinth, the first epistle, which is Paul's response. And the insights that it contains give us understanding of the kinds of things that this original letter from the Chloe's household sent to him had outlined. And so what's clear uh, from a reading of 1 Corinthians, I know many of us have read that book, is that Paul's writing to a church in crisis. It seems that during his absence, the Corinthian church had become overwhelmed by spiritual excesses and all kinds of worldly living by its members. And it had deteriorated into a church where love had gone out the window, where sin was tolerated and where all kinds of agendas and selfishness prevailed. And these destructive elements were threatening its stability and if left unchecked would have shattered the entire unity of the church. Now, some of the issues that Paul was forced to address at Corinth included this one of pride and a lack of love in the pursuit of spiritual gifts. So we're just going to quickly overview some of the key concerns of 1 Corinthians here. It seems that some of the Corinthians had become obsessed with spiritual gifts, especially speaking in tongues. Uh, certain individuals in the congregation were speaking in tongues so much during worship that it was affecting their gatherings and it had become a stumbling block to visitors. Uh, these ones would have for their tongue speaking ability, but it was causing problems in the church. It seems that in their zeal, these charismaniacs were getting caught up in themselves and in the process were taking on a superior attitude. 
Their arrogant behavior, it seems, was also stirring feelings of inferiority and jealousy in the other less gifted members of the congregation. Uh, Paul goes to inform these ones that while spiritual gifts are great and excellent and good and profitable to the building of the church, when they're not exercised in love, they risk doing more harm than good. Uh, the corrective Paul offers to the Corinthians is found in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 1 where he says this, he says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy especially prophecy. He says, uh, love needs to be at the forefront of every spiritual activity in the church. A uh, love has to undergird it. It has to be uh, everything we do is grounded in an aspect of love. For when spiritual gifts or anything for that matter are exercised in love, they have the power to touch the loves of people with the presence of God. And we know from Paul's epistle there to the Corinthians he goes to explain that prophecy would strengthen the whole church, whereas speaking in tongues without an interpretation would only benefit the tongue speaker, him or herself. For Paul, all the gifts in the world without love would amount to nothing more than a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Well, another concern that Paul goes on to bring to us concerns a flawed understanding of wisdom. A flawed understanding of wisdom. Getting a bit ahead of myself here in the slide. So the Corinthians being Greeks were great lovers of wisdom. And, uh, you know, the Greeks were they're known for utilizing reason and intellect to try and understand life and all of its complexities. But the problem was that some of this spirit had crept into the Corinthian church, you know, and it was leading to displays of prideful boasting. And so Paul's strategy to address this was to start to redefine for the Corinthians what true wisdom looked like. A wisdom for the apostle wasn't to be found in the lofty splations or endless theoretical debates about life. For Paul, it could only be known through a revelation of Jesus Christ and the finished work of the cross. For he goes to tell the Corinthians in chapter 1 and at verse 21, these words, he says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. And so Paul redefines wisdom for these people, these Greek believers who were kind of a little bit obsessed with the whole aspect of pursuing wisdom. Another key concern for Paul in his letter to the Corinthians was this phenomenon known as hero worship. Hero worship. And this was something that was confronting the Corinthian church, the reality that little fan clubs had began uh, to develop within it. You know, some loved Paul, some loved Peter, others loved Apollos. Different traveling speakers were coming through and appearing on the scene. And these ones were also being put up on pedestals, making superstars out of them. Now, we know none of those things happen in the church anymore, right? <laughs> but this had led to the Corinthians boasting in certain leaders and showing favoritism to them, which was further fracturing and dividing the church. And we know an obvious danger is when a particular leader is put up on a pedestal is that it doesn't take too much time for their ministry to start to become more about them than about glorifying God. And so hero worship also keeps believers in a state of over-dependence on that particular leader, a prominent 20th century pastor and theologian, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he made a sobering observation about hero worship when he said this. He said, the life of discipleship is not the hero worship we would pay to a good master, but obedience to the Son of God. You know, Paul's response to the the problem of hero worship in the Corinthian church was to emphasize that regardless of how gifted or charismatic a leader was, they were merely simply a servant of God. He says in chapter 3 verse 5, 
What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. So he puts them in their place in this whole aspect of hero worship and begins to tell them, hey, these guys, they're just, you know, they're just servants. They've been given to you as a gift. Well, there's another concern that was plaguing the Corinthian church that Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians, which was the rampant sexual immorality that was taking place there. You know, the city of Corinth was famous in the ancient world for sexual promiscuity. In fact, one philosopher at the time said, you know, to act like a Corinthian was to act in a very sexually promiscuous way. And... It was famous for that whole sexual promiscuity, mainly on account of the temple prostitution associated with the worship of pagan gods. Uh, The temple of Aphrodite, and it's in the picture on the screen, within the city limits, was home to thousands of priestesses, glorified prostitutes, in fact, who serviced the worshippers. Now, Paul, having lived in Corinth for some 18 months, uh, he was very keenly aware of the lifestyle of many of its inhabitants. And he could accept that sexual immorality of every kind had been rife among the Corinthians prior to their conversion. But now he's greatly concerned that a number of them were continuing in their sexual lifestyle of sin after turning to Christ. And his advice to the guilty parties, which is just as relevant to us here today, was to flee was to flee sexual immorality. The Greek word fugo is a word which holds a lot of weight and it basically means to take flight. It means to run from the situation like the house is on fire. You don't just kind of casually get up and go, oh, the house is on fire. I might get up soon and just uh, wander out. It's like you get out of the house, you know. You flee that place, an effective apostolic advice he gave the church there. And he also takes the opportunity further to begin to warn the offending Corinthians that those continuing in an immoral lifestyle would not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, another issue for Paul in the Corinthian church concerns worldliness and spiritual lackness. Lacksness, should I say. Uh, We hear something of the apostle's exasperation in 1 Corinthians 3.11 when he says this. He says, and I've gone too far because I'm a bit ahead of myself. In 3.1, he says, "Um, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. It's a kind of a very negative thing. I mean, I wouldn't want anyone to write to me with those words. You know, Jeremy, I could not address you as spiritual, (laughs) but as a person who was a mere infant, I'd be kind of a little bit put out by that, you know. Um, Hasn't happened yet. It could still happen. (laughs) Please don't send me an email this week. (laughs) Jeremy, we've been meaning to tell you this for a while now. Um, (laughs) But this is how Paul addresses the church at Corinth. Uh, It seems the Corinthians were stagnating in their newfound faith and they weren't progressing in their new identity in Christ. And this along with a a general lack of love for one another and selfishness was kind of at the heart of other abuses and wrong behaviors that were rife among the congregation. Uh, These begin to show up in things such as drunkenness around the Lord's table. So people were taking that opportunity to not just take the emblems, they were taking the whole bottle, you know, and uh, finishing it. And others were coming in who didn't have food and things and they were being denied. Uh, This kind of wrong behavior was also showing up with members taking each other to court. Not the tennis court, but to the law courts. Uh, It was also showing up in a general lack of love shown to the less fortunate members uh, in the church that perhaps didn't have much to go by. They were poor, they were living in poverty. 
And so each of these concerns that we've looked at that Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians were contributing to the downfall of that church. And it's against this depressing backdrop that Paul brings a reminder to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 1 through to 6. He says these words, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. You know, Paul hadn't come to the Corinthians emphasizing gifts or sensationalizing spiritual experiences. He hadn't come to them promoting intellectualism or you know, elevating a worldly wisdom. He hadn't come to them in those manners, but he'd come to them preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified. By his own admission, this had been his only resolve. His only focus was for this message to be made known to the church that he was ministering to, to make the person of Jesus Christ known to the Corinthians and to reveal his glorious work of salvation through the mechanism of the cross that was the message he sought to impart to them. You know, his whole desire had been for the Corinthians to receive a revelation of Jesus that would ground them in faith, that would reach into every area of their lives to influence the way that they lived and acted, their manner of speech and behaviors and so on. You see, Paul wasn't interested in how many gifts the Corinthians had or in how wise they purported themselves to be. His sole focus, in fact, was Jesus Christ, the finished work of the cross as the means of salvation for them. You know, everything else for Paul was secondary. Gifts and wisdom and intellect and the pursuit of knowledge and so on. Now, Paul was also aware that the message of God sending his only son to die on a cruel, uh, to die a cruel and agonizing death on a cross for the sins of the world wasn't an easy message to accept. And it's not an easy message for us to accept either at times. And, uh, you know, I know that I used to struggle with it myself. In fact, for the Greeks, it was an offensive message. Uh, what kind of God, the Greeks would say, would allow God to you know, bring his, his only son to die in the most abased and vile manner as the means of salvation? And they found that a stumbling block to them and to their understanding and logic. And that's why Paul underscores a truth with the Greek Corinthians that something they needed to understand, he states in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 18, he says this, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You know, the message of the cross as the way of salvation is always going to conflict with the wisdom of this world. Uh, in a previous life, I used to be a chef, and it seems like a long time ago. That's why I call it a previous life. I'm not promoting reincarnation. Don't, don't get upset with me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I used to work in kitchens, and I remember when I became a Christian, and it was at this church here, and I became a Christian here in 1992. <laughs> I was baptized in that very same pool, October the 19th, 1992. And uh, anyway, I was working as a chef and I was excitedly telling the people I worked with, I've become a Christian, expecting them all to open the champagne and bring out the, you know, <laughs> the, the nice things and, and have nice praise and stuff to say. And it was like, oh, why did you go and do that for? And, uh, and swearing and cursing. And then from then on, it was like, you know, it was World War Three every time I went to work. And uh, I had to try to pray just to get through another day in the kitchen because now they saw me as a Christian. Now they didn't like it. They said, hey, we used to like you before. You used to be quite a good sort. 
You were a good guy before you became a Christian. <laughs> and now you're this irrelevant uh, kind of guy that we don't really like to be around. <laughs> and, uh, and I had to kind of weather that storm. You know, I had to kind of learn how to manage that. But it was because the message that I was now sharing and proclaiming didn't fit with them. It was causing conflict, and the gospel is always going to cause conflict wherever we preach it, wherever we try and share our faith. But you know, there's been times in the past when I attempted to try to make the gospel more palatable to those I shared my faith with. You know, I tried to sort of soup it up a bit, you know, and make it sound a bit more razzle-dazzled. And, you know, if you come to God, he's going to do this for you. And you're going to be wearing a Rolex watch and you're going to be driving a Lamborghini in three years' time. Now, that didn't really work for me, but I used to tell other people things like that, you know. Just come to God and, hey, you're going to find this is going to happen and that's going to happen. And I was always trying to add human wisdom to the message of the gospel. And it took me a long time to realize that the gospel will never be cool or popular. It's not meant to be. It's always going to stumble some. It's always going to cause division in families and, and households and work situations. It's never meant to be a popular message, but it's God's message that is given to us. It's God's message of life. And it's through the preaching of the cross that God's power is released to bring about all the provisions and all the promises of salvation that Jesus' death and resurrection unlocks. Amen? You know, a trap in uh, contemporary Christianity is to try and somehow make the gospel more appealing to the world around it. Have you noticed that? Or maybe don't watch the YouTube clips that I watch. Um, but there's this tendency or this trap to try and jazz it up a little bit, make it sound better and, uh, and more palatable. Where Jesus is offered as the means to a comfortable, successful life, no strings attached. I believe this accounts for the high turnover in the church where people believe for a season, but they fall away during times of testing because they never really understood what true discipleship looks like. You see, there's a cross all of us must take up if we're to, to follow in the footsteps of the one who laid his life down for us. There is a cross that we're going to have to carry as well. You know, Paul never sought the adulation of others. And that's why he reminds the Corinthians that when he came to them, his ministry wasn't according to excellence of speech or according to human wisdom. You see, Paul wasn't at all interested in presenting himself as a distinguished orator or philosopher. He wasn't interested in appealing to itching ears or being popular, one of the boys, so to speak. He recognized that knowing God and experiencing his gift of salvation could only come about through an embrace of the revelation of the cross of Christ. You see, Paul knew the difference between ministry that is spiritual and ministry which is soulish. Soulish ministry is ministry that entertains and it appeals to human emotions and wants and needs. It's all about making people feel good about themselves. You know, I feel good about this message or I feel good about this thing. And it sort of can speak to those wants and desires. It's ministry that too often glosses over sin and incorporates human wisdom in its approach to accomplish its end. Spiritual ministry, on the other hand, presents the truth of God's word in a way that glorifies Christ and reaches the heart and conscience of its hearers, even when it's hard to accept, even when it's not popular. And so when Paul tells the Corinthians that he came to them in weakness and with great fear and, and trembling, he's emphasizing that his performance was neither impressive nor attractive, but it gave evidence of his deep reverence towards God. A soulish ministry always downplays the need for reverence towards God. 
Instead, it prevents, uh, presents God in a trivial way as the means for personal success, personal enrichment, self-entitlement, creating spiritual narcissists in the process. It encourages the idea of following God as a way to guarantee a pain-free existence where all our whims and desires are catered for, which, my friends, is not the gospel. Soulish ministry also fails to address sin. Instead, it kind of sweeps it under the mat, promoting a false sense of security in our salvation. But for Paul, his message and his preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. You know, according to the standards of this world, Paul might never have been considered a great communicator. In spite of this, the Spirit of God worked powerfully through his preaching to bring about conviction of sin and conversion to God. And this was so the faith of the Corinthians might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. You see, Paul knew of the dangers that some of his hearers might be more interested in the eloquence of his message and in his personality rather than in the message of Christ. And that's why his highest goal when preaching to the Corinthians was for them to put their whole trust in God And as they did, they would begin to experience the remarkable and glorious wonders of the presence of God invading and impacting their lives uh, for themselves. And in turn, uh, they would avoid the trap of looking to human wisdom for answers to spiritual truths. You see, we'll never find answers to spiritual matters according to the wisdom of this world. We too must realize that God can never be reduced to a concept we try and understand through human logic. Instead, God can only be experienced by revelation and as we put our whole trust in him. And as we surrender and as we yield, we begin to find that there is a revelation of the cross of Christ that's imprinted upon the tablets of our hearts that gives to us an understanding of what life is really all about. And that releases the presence of God to us. This releases God's power to do its work for the message of salvation is God's message and carries with it God's power. You know, the same issues that sought to divide the Corinthian church are the same things that challenge the church of the 21st century. I wonder if we could just maybe have Chris up here. It just said we're going to get ready to close shortly. But it's, it's so evident when we read that epistle to the church at Corinth, that first letter. The same issues Paul addresses are the same things that get regurgitated in our each generation, you know, just in different forms of it, really. And they are issues that challenge us too. The issues that can bring division among fellowship and groups and cell groups and, and can fracture unity. Those things such as pride and loveless expressions of Christianity. Hero worship, where the adulation becomes about a particular leader and it brings division or all kinds of sin, compromise, worldliness that can infect a gathering. Uh, These are the things we have to keep checked, you know, uh, in our own hearts about. These are things that we always have to be keeping it about Jesus because as we kind of come to a close today, I just want to try and bring everything together here. It's really about making it all about Jesus. It really has to come down to making it all about Jesus Christ. You know, the corrective to all of these ills, to all of these problems that plague the Corinthian church and that manifest in different ways in our own situations and modern contexts, the corrective to those problems is a decision to build a life on the same resolve that Paul came to the Corinthians preaching that strong resolve, that strong focus, not to get enamored with peripheral issues and situations on the kind of sidelines, but to keep the main thing the main thing, which is Jesus Christ and advancing his purposes and advancing his kingdom here on earth. And this requires that our focus becomes all about the person of Jesus as Savior as well as Lord. And when this becomes our goal, 
Unity in the body becomes possible since our whole focus will be on glorifying Jesus Christ and enjoying the blessing that unity attracts, amen? And so it's a wonderful thing when we think about the thing, the beautiful, the beautiful work of salvation that God brings to us through the cross, that place of agony, that place of death, that place of rebellion, but it opens the door to each and every one of us experiencing something that can be so profound and life-changing. And I know for myself, 31 years ago, you know, when I made that decision, I mean, my life hasn't been perfect. My life has been a bit up and down. If you don't believe me, just ask my mother here later on and she'll inform you of all my issues and struggles and challenges over the years. And I'm sure you can concur. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Life isn't perfect for any one of us. But the glue that holds us here is our faith in Christ, is our understanding that it's through the cross comes every provision of the cross. His finished work opens the door to the restoration that we need, to families being reconciliated, to seeing situations of bereavement and grief and tragedy healed and consoled in the love of Christ. And it's a wonderful thing that God wants to do those things for us, but He's uh, believing, uh, I'm believing uh, that the word that I was meant to share today, and it's been a hard word, I know that. Uh, it's not been my normal kind of preaching style, perhaps, but I believe it's about making it about Jesus, coming back to that focus, not to get divided about little minor doctrinal points, little opinions and preferences. We can all hold those things, but they aren't the main things. They are the secondary things. The primary focus is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen. Why don't we close our eyes for a moment? Father, we thank You for this time. We thank You for this wonderful service and Your presence has been here and real. We thank You for those baptized and who've been brought into such a place of commitment and loyalty to your cause. We thank you, Lord, for each and every one in this room. And we know there's challenges that many face. We know there are situations that some are facing that they can't see a way of escape. But through the cross, Lord, we proclaim that there is deliverance. Through the cross, we proclaim the hope and the promise that is there, that Jesus Christ is the hope of glory in each and every one. And so, Lord, we proclaim that it is the cross of Christ that saves, that restores, that heals, that sets free, and that brings your purpose here on earth into each and every one's life. And so, Lord, we just want to thank you for this time. And I also pray this morning that perhaps there's been some people here and the Lord's been just impressing upon you through the word and through the service that there is things that you need to let go of so that there would be unity in your life. It's not always about winning an argument. It's not always about having an opinion. Sometimes it's about bringing everything back to the simplicity of the cross. And that is the place of security. And that is the area that we can all agree on. And so it could be that we need to do some of those things and make some of those adjustments. It could also be that there's somebody here that just wants to say yes to Jesus Christ today. Maybe you haven't made that commitment yet. I made it 31 years ago and uh, I've never looked back and I've never regretted for a moment that decision because God has been faithful each and every step of the way. And so we, while we still have our eyes closed, perhaps there is someone in that situation. If there is, you might want to acknowledge me by raising your hand. Would anyone like to say yes to Jesus this morning? I'm not going to keep it open long. No, that's okay. Um, one person at the back, thank you for your hand. And um, please feel free to come down here afterwards. And uh, we, we'd like to really pray for you. Uh, well, maybe we'll pray for you now. How does that sound? <laughs> uh, why don't we all just uh, maybe stand to our feet? We just want to support the sister at the back here who's indicated through the raising of her hand that she wants to know you, Lord. We just pray for her today.
We don't know her circumstances. We don't know the challenges that she's gone through, but you're a good God. And maybe we can also say this prayer in community and showing love to our sister here today. Lord Jesus, why don't we repeat these words after me? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are God. We thank you that you sent your only begotten son so that we could have life, so that we could have life in abundance. Lord, we bring our sins to you. We bring our regrets to you. We bring our failures to you. And we ask that you would forgive us of all transgressions. And you would set us free to live the life that you've ordained for us to live. We receive you into our hearts this day, Lord. Be my Lord, be my Savior. In Jesus' name. And we just um, pray for our sister here today and we ask Holy Spirit that you would touch her afresh, that you would pour into her hearts, uh, her heart many uh, things that you have to impress to her. And, you know, even as I just pray for you from here, I just get a real sense that you've gone through a season of real brokenness and things haven't gone your way and there's been great disappointments in your past. There's been many closed doors to opportunities that you're trying to get through. There were many no's instead of yeses and you had to go through situations of setback. But you are a survivor. You are an overcomer. You are a person who is determined to turn your life around and God's sees that commitment and that desire to want to change and he says I'll work with you where you're at small steps to start with baby steps to start with because there is stuff he's going to surface that's going to need to be addressed there is stuff of brokenness but the Lord is your healer and he's going to surprise you with uh, glimpses of his love and he's going to show you his mercy and he's even going to reveal to you a dream for your life that you can begin to develop and work towards and see something beautiful that's come out of the brokenness and out of the ash that your life had been reduced to in the past and you will see the goodness of God in the land of the living and even though there's been bereavement and tragedy and death around you in different situations God is going to put longevity upon your life so that there would be a time of praise and proclamation that would come through your own voice in Jesus name Amen Thank you everyone Praise God. Well, that's a bit of a challenge. Sometimes we've got to hear the word of the Lord directly. Maybe today you have felt all of a sudden that you realised you've, you've thought God to be a great provider and a great, but haven't really just surrendered everything to Him. Or maybe it's a challenge for you today to realise that you are going to go through issues um, and you've gone through some and you thought, God, why is that happening to me? We'd love to be a part of praying for you and, and to see God minister to those situations and to see God touch your life. We always, you know, there's something that really touches me is when you stand with someone else. God stands with you when we stand with someone else, you know, and so we want to be a part of anything. So if you've got something you'd like us to pray for, you're most welcome to come forward. We're going to close this part of the service and we, we're going to, you know, fellowship after, uh, at the back. We've got um, some tea and coffee. There are a couple of notices that I, I need to bring. We've got tonight, we've got a Power of Men's Power and Glory Night here at the church at seven o'clock. Come along and just open your hearts to, to receive and to see what God can do through men of God and through people being touched by His Spirit. We've got a woman's breakfast next Saturday with Sue Bonavi speaking on the 1st of July. You can register for that up at the info desk. So that's the Saturday, for next Saturday. And then we've got a team night on the 4th of July, Tuesday week, that if you want to be a part of the team and want to connect with us, we'd love you to be a part of that. So Lord, I just want to thank you for each one that's part of the service. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for the baptisms. We pray for each one that's made that public confession and we ask your hand upon them and your, your touch upon them and the families and the members that have been a part of that. We pray your blessing upon your church, upon your people. And we, Lord, align ourselves and our hearts towards Jesus Christ, the Saviour, the Healer, the Redeemer, the Friend. We align our hearts towards you, God. And I pray for a week that just keeps Jesus as number one and in that right place in our lives. 
And I ask your touch upon each person in this service for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. If you want prayer, most welcome to come forward. Great having you part of the service. And if you're a man and you're available, we'll see you tonight at seven o'clock. Bless you.